devastation tonight in Houston. A once in a thousand year storm showing no signs of letting up. Yeah, my God, my God. With crews stretched thin, neighbors turn into heroes, helping people in need. If you needed proof of just how bad this storm is, this is it. Houston before Harvey on the top, below is how it looks right now. A natural disaster of epic proportion is playing out as we speak. FEMA estimates 30,000 people need emergency shelter right now. Ben is tracking the storm. Jason Colthorpe is with a local nonprofit set to mobilize to Texas. And Hank Winchester is following how we can help. Let's start with Jay Gray, though, live in Houston. Jay? Good evening. We're in a neighborhood that, like dozens across the city right now, is underwater. More than 400 people have been rescued from this community as the rain continues to fall. The water climbing, pushing into places it's never been before. The rain here just won't stop. The people who have lived here 25, 30, 40 years haven't, haven't seen anything like this. Water swallowing entire neighborhoods, forcing its way into homes. This was more than we can imagine. And more than many can bear. The rescue people came and took us to what I was here. Some areas have already taken on more than 20 inches of rain, and before it's over, that number could double. This is a landmark event. We have not seen an event like this. Every member of the Texas National Guard has been deployed, joined by state and local law enforcement, federal agents, and a volunteer Navy, all scrambling to pull thousands to higher ground. Uh, we are still involved in the search and rescue process. Using every available asset, Coast Guard choppers, boats, even flatbed trucks. It's over five feet in our house. We barely made it out. I'm just so grateful that they came. And the effort is far from over. It's still a, a very dangerous situation out there. It's, uh, we're expecting more rain. Rescue teams like the nation's fourth largest city now stretch to their limits, but still delivering survivors to safety All right. and shelters, giving literally everything they can. Thank you. And everything is exactly what they need right now. Yeah, it's something they'll need for quite some time. The rain's expected to continue for at least two more days and then the difficult recovery begins here. Back to you. All right, Jay. I can't even think yet about yeah. what to do after because after exactly. isn't here. Uh, in Houston, we are seeing some amazing acts of heroism as neighbors rescue neighbors caught in the flood. That we are. Our sister station, KSAT, captured this incredible rescue. Strangers rushed into this Houston home to rescue a 91-year-old man trapped on the upper floor of his house as the floodwaters continue to rise. And you can see them there carrying him down the stairs to put him into a raft and to be taken to safety. All right, let's bring in Ben now. We are starting to talk about, hear about parallels to Hurricane Katrina mm -hmm. and the toll that it's taking on people. And you know, and even with the forecast as dire as it was on Friday, that yeah. would have been an unthinkable sentence for you to utter right. on Friday. Right. Yeah, yeah. And here we are. Right. Uh, the five o'clock advisory is in and it looks like the Hurricane Center says expect 10 to 20 more inches of rain in some of these parts of Texas and Louisiana that have been hit so hard. Four live radar showing it is just moderate widespread rain now across most of Harris County, which includes Houston. This is the area that's been hit so hard that I-45 corridor between Houston and Galveston getting a little bit of a breakdown here towards the city of Galveston, but there's still a lot more to go. In fact, when you look at some of these totals, this is just through the early afternoon. So there's about two, three, four hours not accounted for in here. We're pushing 40 inches of rain there in Dayton. These are all areas that are in counties surrounding Houston. So anywhere from near 40 uh, down to down to 32 inches. And of course, we're going to see a lot more before the storm is done. This is the five o'clock advisory has this storm sweeping back into the Gulf, making a second landfall sometime early Wednesday morning and then finally accelerating to the north. By the time we get into the weekend on Saturday, that's going to be a remnant low in southern Illinois. We may have to deal with the remnants of Harvey up here. We'll talk more about that in our forecast coming up, guys. Hey, Ben, as relief organizations and the government rally to help those in need in Houston, a local organization out of Waterford called Disaster Relief at Work, or DRAW for short, is getting ready to send a team of volunteers to help. As Jason Coulthard reports, before they can do that, they need our help. 
Sometimes in a disaster, people need immediate help when the big help is still on the way. That's where draw comes in. The first few days, they're, um, what they need is somebody to care. They're in shock. Their lives have been upended. For five years, Draw has helped disaster victims. Volunteers put together seven different types of buckets filled with daily needs and send them right to those in the disaster zones. It was started by youth pastor Greg Martin, who is currently in Houston, to see what his group can do. But the minute the waters recede, you've got to go in and tear out all the sheetrock. You've got to get all the, the waterlogged furniture out to the street. There will also be trees to clear and roofs to patch, and Draw has a bucket for that too. So in addition to volunteers to go to Texas, Draw needs people to pack the buckets and donate the items or donate money. Whatever is need, we try to provide. Um, pretty quickly so people can get started to mend. Looking around, you can tell Draw has just moved to this new location. So one of the other immediate needs, if you don't want to volunteer and go to Texas, you can come right to the new Waterford place and help put some of these shelves together. That way, the operation can get up and running quickly. Black has been on the front lines and knows how important a bucket of essentials can be in a disaster, as well as something even simpler. Some people just need somebody to hug them or to pray with them. And they can go a long way. Yes, it can. That group of volunteers is expected to leave sometime tomorrow night. If you'd like to get involved and volunteer or donate items or money, we've included all the information for Draw within this story. Click on Detroit.com. Jason Colthorpe, Local 4. I mentioned earlier, hard to, depending on how long it takes for the waters to recede, Draw could have to wait now to head to Houston because, as I mentioned, the end is nowhere in sight yet, Kim. It's absolutely heartbreaking. Well, the remnants of Hurricane Harvey continue to pour over Houston. Thousands have been forced from their homes, losing everything they own, many with no place to go. 1,300 miles away, many of us here in Metro Detroit want to help. Hank Winchester is live in our phone bank tonight. Hank, um, you have a way for people to actually help. We certainly do, Kimberly. And you know, when people need help, it doesn't matter where it is, uh, Detroiters step up to help those in need. We're teaming up with the Red Cross. In fact, I want to bring in Greg, one of our volunteers today, who's been uh, taking different phone calls. The number you can call is 313-298-WDIV. And, and Greg, we've already been seeing a great response. We right? have. The phones have been ringing off the hook with uh, just people calling in with generous donations. It's been absolutely inspiring. And I know when, when people make those donations, they always wonder, how is my money going to be used? Uh, can you talk to us about that? Absolutely. And, you know, those dollars right now are being turned into whatever's needed right now because minute by minute the operation is changing. Right now it could be diapers and shelters. Eventually it could be turned into supplies to help people once we hit the recovery phase. So um, the dollars are really going to help the people in need. And um, so it's just great to see. It is, certainly. Greg, thank you for your time. We thank all the volunteers from the Red Cross that are here in our phone bank. We're going to stay here answering your calls, taking your donations. Again, the number is 313-298-WDAV. We also have all the information for you on our website and also on our Facebook page. We'll be here through our early uh, evening newscast until 630, taking your calls, taking your donations, getting the help to the people that need it the most in Houston. Devin Kimberly, back to you. Hank, and our coverage of the storm continues over the next 90 minutes here on Local 4. Coming up at 530, we'll have a live report from our Nick Monticelli. He is in Texas at this hour. And also at 530, Washington is eyeing the storm closely tonight as the president plans to travel to Texas tomorrow. Coming up at 6, uh, some of the Detroit Lions uh, are reacting to all of this because some of them have very close ties to Houston as well. Yeah, and our coverage also continues online at clickondetroit.com where we're streaming the live coverage from our sister station in Houston, KPRC. You can find the link to that right at the top of the home page. All right, now let's get to a developing story of stranger danger reports in Livingston and Washtenaw counties. At 2 p.m. this past Saturday, a 12-year-old boy in Hamburg reported being approached by a white man in his 20s who was in a gray minivan. Five hours later, two children, two children in Putnam Township said a white man got out of a white van and approached them, then ran back to the van. Uh, then Sunday night in Washtenaw County in Dexter Township, one of two white men in a white van tried to lure a boy to the vehicle. Now, no children were injured. The three incidents police are telling us at this point may be, may be 
related. We'll keep following the investigation. Also, Detroit police investigating the fatal shooting of a man on the city's east side this morning. Officers responded to a call, a 911 call about a body. Police found the body in an alley behind a vacant building at St. Aubin and East Outer Drive. The victim is described as a black man in his 30s. He had been shot in the head. The body has not yet been identified. Detroit police are investigating another suspected homicide, this one on the city's far west side. A man, a white man in his 40s, was found dead in an alley near Paul Street and the Southfield Freeway Service Drive. Investigators are looking for a 2013 model Chrysler 300 with passenger front side wheel damage in connection with this case. Just getting started on what you can see is obviously already a very busy Monday. Indeed, we have much more ahead in this next hour of news, including Hillary Clinton hitting the road and making a stop here in Michigan. And with most kids heading back to school next week, what parents should start doing this week to ease those back to school nerves. Rod? The feds spend weeks on a terrorism investigation and it leads them to this Metro Detroit business. That really scares me. Yeah. That's yeah, really scary. Yeah. Illegal weapons found and an arrest will have full details. And help for Houston. Local 4 teaming up with the Red Cross, taking your donations, making sure that the people of Texas get the help they need. Our phone bank is live right now. The number you can call to make a donation, 313-298-WDIB. We do a lot of new at 6. A 15-year-old dies in a Michigan State police chase on this street. Now Detroit's police chief wants to know exactly what happened and why. We're announcing that we are opening up an independent investigation. This is a nightmare. A nightmare that right now has too many unanswered questions. All right, Steve, a few months ago, this cancer-fighting teacher had to wear a backpack oxygen tank just to visit her students at Chippewa Valley High School. Wait until you see her now. That story is coming up new at 6. Now let's get to brand new information into an arrest by the FBI over the weekend. The federal courthouse was unusually busy after the FBI's terror unit arrested a man on gun charges, but the case could end up being a whole lot bigger than just that. Rod Maloney explains how a storage locker may be the key to the case. The feds had been watching Yusuf Muhammad Ramadan, especially when he paid a visit here to a storage facility in Ann Arbor. They arrested him on some relatively minor weapons charges, and it appears that there's more to this case than meets the eye. 28-year-old Yusuf Mohammed Ramadan has the terrorism task force's attention and they aren't saying why. As of now, he's facing charges for having a Jensen semi-automatic 22 caliber handgun and a Ruger 22 semi-automatic that had their serial numbers filed off. Not exactly the terrifying weapons of global terror, but the court filing says that Ramadan, his wife and children were boarding a Royal Jordanian jetliner when they started questioning him. He reportedly told them he had a storage unit here at the Devon self-storage facility facility on South State Street in Ann Arbor. He admitting to having two rifles and a nine millimeter Glock handgun here. Then he changed his story saying he'd given the guns to a friend. But the feds get a warrant for the locker and found the weapons plus the two with the bad serial numbers. Up until a couple of weeks ago, Ramadan and his family lived in this apartment at the Willow Ridge apartment complex in Ypsilanti. Neighbor Terry Howard tells us she liked them. He seemed to be a nice guy, to be honest with you. They seem to be really nice people. Mm -hmm. I've never seen him, they never got in any mm -hmm. trouble while they were out here, so, mm -hmm. because they weren't out here that long, mm -hmm. actually. The feds claim Ramadan did what he could to make it look like he didn't rent the storage locker himself, putting his wife's name on it, but they say he was paying for it all along. As for the possibility of living next door to an alleged terrorist. And is that at all of any concern? Yes, it is, that's really scary because, um, you never know who you're living next to or, or who your children are playing with or whatever, you know, and that's really scary to me. Lots and lots of unanswered questions in this case. We're likely to get some of those answers when they hold a detention hearing tomorrow at 1 o'clock in federal court. In Ann Arbor, Rod Maloney, Local 4. Okay, Rod, and federal investigators also say they found parts for an AR-15 semi-automatic rifle in that storage locker, but so far there are no charges related to that discovery. All right, we bring uh, Ben back in. Last week when we were talking about maybe it being three feet of rain, that seemed outrageous, and now we're talking about beyond that. We were kind of rolling our eyes yeah. at right. just yeah. the thought of 35 inches, yeah. and they've hit that, yeah. and it is still not over down there. I mean, it is 
I feel so bad for them, yeah. It's, it's yeah. horrendous. Yeah. Because you know a lot of folks who have dealt with flooding in the past, you know how long that cleanup yep. process can be. Yeah. And, and these folks don't even know where the start is going to be. Yeah. Again, uh, we keep to, we've seen great scenes of everybody trying to help, and we know people all over want to help. We will keep showing you ways to do that. That's right. Up. Yeah. Absolutely. And we've got some rain here. Uh, obviously nothing like what they're dealing with down there, but there's one storm that we are keeping an eye on in Oakland County. Uh, this thing is definitely seen, showing a lot of lightning strikes and some heavy rain, but when we zoom in a little bit closer on our velocity scan, this is starting to show a little bit of rotation, but this is broad scale rotation, not tight. Uh, so this storm could be rotating. And also when we look at the wind shear, uh, that's definitely seeing uh, some activity there as far as the winds changing direction and speed with height. So we're going to continue watching this storm. It's probably on the strong side right now and definitely a lot of lightning. Uh, so if you're around that area, be careful. Also, we're seeing more storms here moving out of the uh, southern end of Sandalite County out towards Sandusky. Still very electric. A lot of uh, lightning with that storm as well. No severe warnings out for us. Big difference down south when there are flood watches and warnings all over the place here in the Gulf Coast. And you can see it is still raining in Houston. A little bit of good news. Well, I, I guess we'll start with the, the best good news. At least they're not dealing with a tornado threat anymore and they can just focus on the water. But your forecast map showing that it is still going to be raining through tonight, although the heavier rain looks like it's going to start pulling a little bit further to the east of Houston. But there will be still places outside of Harris County that continue to get walloped overnight. Once we get into sunrise tomorrow morning, uh, it looks like that rain will try to move a little bit further to the east. But there are still places in Louisiana and especially over in New Orleans. Uh, you know some of the issues that they've had with flood control in years past, uh, so they're definitely not looking forward to the amount of rain that they're going to get dumped on them here in the next 24 hours. Back home, once we see these showers and storms fade tonight, we'll call it an isolated shower overnight. Chances do ramp up again tomorrow, especially in the afternoon. Showers and a few thunderstorms expected. And then our unsettled weather pretty much comes to an end. And once this cold front crosses through on Thursday, that's going to drop the humidity. We've got a very dry finish to the work week and temperatures will start responding as well. But tomorrow, 74 degrees and we will be seeing those scattered showers and thunderstorms breaking down those temperatures in our four zone forecast. That's going to be some of our warmer numbers right here in our metro zone where we look for the mid 70s down here in our south zone. There will be a couple spots that probably pick up 76 77 closer to the state line Blissfield. Morency, Adrian, you'll be uh, three of those locations. West zone, couple spots may stay in the upper 60s here. Milford, Clarkston, Flint, Fenton, uh, and areas further north, upper 60s. Looks like as good as you're going to do tomorrow and right around 70 in our north zone with some slightly cooler numbers towards the lake in Lexington and Port Huron. So we will see temperatures rise towards Wednesday. Then that cold front comes through. We get a little bit of a drop in temperature, but the big noticeable difference will be much lower humidity and we'll see decent amount of sunshine there for Wednesday. Thursday as well. Arts Beats and Eats looks pretty good for the stretch. We could see a shower around Saturday night into Sunday. That looks like the potential remnants of Harvey. Right now, I think most of that stuff's going to stay to our south. But uh, if you've been watching this, you know Harvey's got a mind of its own. So yeah. Yeah. keep an eye on it. Yeah. Okay, man. Okay, ben. Well, some owners of the new Chevy Bolt are running into a very big problem. New tonight, what's causing some cars to have no acceleration when the dash says there's plenty of battery? Whoops. Also, uh, the Midtown Whole Foods turns into a crime scene, a violent confrontation in the parking lot. We'll have that next. And we want to remind you of our Help for Houston phone bank. We're working with the Red Cross to help raise money for the victims in Texas to donate. Pick up your phone, call 313-298-WDIV. We'll be right back. The local for Detroit police are looking for two young women in connection with a stabbing outside a Midtown grocery store. A 21 year old woman got into an altercation last night outside Whole Foods with the mother of her boyfriend's child and another woman. We have seen video. Um, the 21 year old woman was stabbed in the back. She is recovering. The two women allegedly involved in the attack ages 18 and 19 got away. The driver of a pickup truck that ran into the rear of a semi this morning in Lyon Township is in critical condition. Yeah, police say the semi stopped as it prepared to turn into a business on Grand River east of South Hill Road. When the pickup hit the rear of the semi, the pickup driver was not wearing a seatbelt, had to be extracted from the truck and airlifted to Royal Oak Beaumont Hospital. The semi driver was not injured.
Former presidential candidate, former Secretary of State, former Senator, former First, First Lady, lady go on Hillary on. Clinton hitting the road on a cross-country tour for her new book called What Happened. And she'll be making a stop right here in Michigan. Clinton will make her stop at University of Michigan's Hill Auditorium on October 24th, where she's expected to talk about her failed presidential campaign in 2016 and President Trump. Her new book goes on sale September 12th. For more information, go to click on Detroit.com. Big investments are coming to the future workforce here in Detroit. In fact, an investment worth $10 million. Today, Mayor Duggan and DPS Superintendent Nikolai Vidi were on hand at the Randolph Career Technical Center to announce a multi-million dollar investment in hopes to train 900 students and 900 adults over the next three years. 300 high school students here in the day, 300 adults in this space at night, uh, and as we continue to build the, the high rises and the development that's coming to this city, uh, we're going to be really proud to say it's the residents of the city of Detroit building Detroit's future. Congratulations to everybody who made this possible. Open houses for interested students will begin sometime later this week. New at 530. Easing those back to school nerves. What parents need to do this week to make the transition back to class a whole lot easier. And President Trump heading to Texas tomorrow to address the disaster area, what he's told his cabinet members to do in response to the storm coming up. And we, of course, continue to follow the devastation from Houston. These are live pictures from KTRK, where a camera crew is on board a boat that is out making rescues. A live update right after the break. Stick around. We have salute. At this hour, much of Houston is underwater and the rain is not going to be letting up anytime soon. Starting there at 530, our Nick Monticelli traveled to Houston this morning to help our sister station there, and that's KPRC TV. That's right. He's been very busy, as we see. He joins us now live. He flew into San Antonio this morning and on your way to Katy, Texas, and that's an area that's been especially hit hard, Nick. Uh, give us some perspective. How difficult has it been just to get to where you are right now? It has been incredibly difficult. Mind you, we had to land into San Antonio because every airport in Houston is closed. In fact, all 10 airports surrounding that area are closed and will be at least until Thursday of this week. Norm is working the camera. Our field producer, Dota, is driving right now to allow this live shot. You can see right now, we are still about 50 or 60 miles outside of Houston, and the winds are horrible, the rain is bad, and there have been many, many flooding issues in the rivers and creeks alongside the highway, and even some of the roads that are outside those high-lying areas. We've also got some video that our producer, Dota, shot as we were driving. You can see just how high those areas are. Are, and these are not areas that you would expect to see flooding. Like back at home, we have specific areas like parks that are set up to be flood areas in case of torrential rainfall like this. Those areas that are flooding right now are not that. That is how bad it is right now. And to give you some perspective on the logistics of what is happening here in the Houston area, again, as you mentioned, we are working for our sister station in Houston, KPRC. We went to San Antonio first and met up with another sister station for a couple of things. They need a propane because they have to cook all of their own food. There was no power, no way to eat. We just stopped at a gas station and filled 24 gallons worth of gas and strapped it to the top of this SUV because there are no gas stations working in the Houston area, at least very few of them. So they don't have an opportunity to even gas up their trucks, their SUVs, their live trucks to do their live broadcast. And on top of all that, they're having very difficulty just finding hotel rooms, getting back to their own station, all because of this. This is going to be an issue for days to come. As we have been reporting and Ben has been tracking, this tropical storm, after it stopped being a hurricane, essentially parked on top of Houston. They were not expecting it that to happen. They knew they were going to get a lot of rainfall. They were not expecting it just to stop like this and become a major issue. So that is why we are here to help those crews out. In the meantime, they are doing wall to wall coverage, which, which means they went on when their hurricane started. They have not been off since. So we're here to help them. But of course, we'll bring us updates right here on Local 4 as well. We are near Katy in Texas. Nick Monticelli, Local 4. Yeah, Nick, you, you raise a great point. A lot of these reporters, producers, and photographers are absolutely exhausted. We know the uh, KHOU, another television station, was completely flooded out of their own studio. So the ordeal of uh, trying to cover that is a whole other facet to this story, isn't it? 
You know, it really is, and uh, we actually talked to uh, a few friends of those at KHOU. Their anchor team was on the air when their studio started flooding. They stayed on the air as long as they could, went up to a second floor, and now they're broadcasting from a federal building. And many have asked, why are you going to Katy? Why not Houston? Katy is a town that is west of downtown Houston, and officials in that area had to make a decision. They decided that instead of letting Houston continue to flood, they were opening dams in the Katy area. They had to choose which town to save. So right now, Katy is going to be underwater while they try to save Houston. Wow. All right. So obviously a very compelling situation that you're driving into. The three of you uh, be safe, Nick. We will talk to you again here very soon. Uh, I was mentioning earlier, if you, for those of us who've covered hurricanes before, mm -hmm. nobody necessarily sympathizes with the reporters because they're covering people whose situations are far worse uh, than the ordeals that they're dealing with. But covering the, it's very dangerous, obviously, for one thing. Uh, and there's, of course, there's no place to go to, you know, nothing's open. So there's and no place to go get. And too with the hurricane, you get hit, but then you recover. Well, yeah. they're not having any time to recover because they're getting the rain. Yeah. And then it's going to go back and yeah, hit yeah, again later yeah. in Texas in a couple days. Yeah, I'll tell you, the, this storm, uh, there was a meteorologist, I think, earlier uh, somewhere else in the state that did the math on this. They have had the equivalent of 12 Lake St. Clairs mm. dumped on that state since Harvey has started. I mean, there's no Sorry, good even, answers. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, when you talk about choosing, you know, who, what towns to save, I mean, somebody's going to get it because this water's got to go somewhere. Uh, here's a look at four live radar. It is still raining from Houston to the west, and Mother Nature has been trying to kill Harvey uh, in myriad ways, but this is one of them. Dry air getting sucked into this storm, and when you have a weak tropical storm, in most cases, this would be enough to kill it, but uh, Harvey doesn't want to get on the cart. <laughs> it is still spinning down there, and here's one of the reasons why. You look at the water temperatures just off the coast of uh, Galveston here in the Gulf. That is almost 90 degree water uh, that's sitting there in the Gulf. That's just jet fuel for hurricanes. So as Harvey tries to reemerge here in the Gulf, uh, it is going to be restrengthening somewhat, but definitely not weakening as it moves through. We'll keep our eye on the thunderstorms here in Oakland County and the rest of Southeast Michigan coming up, guys. Ben, now back to Harvey. President Trump is going to travel to Texas tomorrow to visit uh, the areas that have been so devastated. His first major natural disaster, of course, is commander in chief, and he's promised to send whatever resources are necessary to help with the recovery. Blaine Alexander has more from Washington. Blaine. Well, Devin, President Trump had said that he wanted his visit to cause as little disruption as possible. So that's why he and the First Lady are visiting the Corpus Christi area rather than Houston, because that area is still bracing for more rain and more flooding. In less than 24 hours, President Trump will head to Texas, where rescue efforts are still going strong in the wake of Hurricane Harvey. And they're like, you gotta get out, you gotta get out. Since Friday morning, President Trump has tweeted nearly two dozen times about the storm, promising relief and praising the rescue workers on the ground. He told the cabinet members, lean in aggressively. Everything we can provide, do it as quickly as possible. In the meantime, the president staying busy in Washington, reversing an Obama-era policy that limited surplus military gear given to local police departments. That policy made after protesters clashed with police three years ago in Ferguson, Missouri. At the time, the Justice Department said that equipment only escalated the situation. Today, Attorney General Jeff Sessions called it a matter of public safety. It's about getting the job done, getting everyone to safety, protecting the community. Good equipment saves lives. But at least one Republican disagrees, Senator Rand Paul calling it an unprecedented expansion of government power and overreach beyond just helping to reduce crime. And today, President Trump declared a federal emergency for parts of Louisiana. He had already done this for Texas. This now allows both states to receive federal relief. In Washington, Blaine Alexander, Local 4. All right, Blaine. Now, Local 4 is uh, working to find help for Houston. Some areas uh, could get, as Ben mentioned, up to 50 inches of rain. Thousands are going to watch their homes and their livelihoods, in a lot of cases, really destroyed. So we bring in Help Me Hank. He is live in our phone bank and has been there all afternoon. And you're talking with Metro Detroiters who are hoping to help Houston residents and getting a lot of calls. Uh, we certainly have been, Karen and Devin. And, you know, we've received $5 donations. We've received $500 donations. Every little bit helps. And 
we are teaming up with the Red Cross. You can see volunteers here right now taking your calls. The number to call is 313-298-WDIV. Uh, you see the images uh, shared by Nick Monticelli and the other national reporters uh, that were coming to us live from the Houston area. You see the devastation firsthand and you understand the desperate need for people not only in Houston, but throughout the state of Texas. That again is why we are teaming up uh, with the American Red Cross. Many volunteers from Metro Detroit already down there on the ground and your donations will help those affected by this tragedy. Again, the number you can call right now, 313-298-WDIV. Uh, we will keep the phone bank open through our early evening newscast until 6.30. Karen, Devin, back to you. All right, thank you, Hank. General Motors getting in touch with owners of the Chevy Bolt electric car. A uh, problem has come up uh, involving the battery system, and of course, that's the centerpiece of the car. GM says some Bolt models may incorrectly report the remaining charge in the battery. As a result, the car could simply stop when you're thinking you've got plenty of power left. The problem affects uh, just 1% of the 10,000 Bolt models sold to date. GM will contact the owners. They will provide service to fix the problem. In good health. Some local students are already back in class and the rest are soon to follow after Labor Day. But what should you do if your child is getting a little nervous about that big first day? Kimberly Gill here with a look at uh, what the experts advise. Kim? Yeah, school's right around the corner and experts say it is normal to actually feel a little bit anxious, especially if your child is starting kindergarten or making the jump to middle school or high school. But there are steps you can take this week to help ease their fears. It's almost time to climb on the school bus, but before the first day arrives, take a moment to reassure your kindergartner. One of the things that, that really young kids um, need to learn is that you're going to come back and pick them up. Blake Lancaster is a clinical psychologist at U of M's CS Mott Children's Hospital. He says a little practice can go a long way. Kids at the five-year-old developmental level, they're very much at a show-me stage not a explain it to me stage. And I think that's just so critical for, for parents to understand. Be sure to attend any meet the teacher events or arrange a visit to the school. And this really gives kids the opportunity to like find out where the bathroom is, where the cafeteria is, get to know a few of the kids in the classroom. Practice is important for older kids too, whether it's practicing their locker combination or walking through how to change classes. If you are feeling anxious about your child starting school, it's okay to share that, but don't go overboard. If you have fears, I think honesty is always the best policy. Like you can share those with your kid, but just don't, you don't have to prolong them. Say something like, I'm anxious too. Like, I, you know, this is a new experience for me too, but you know, based on what we've done, I, I think it's going to be okay. Now, for teens and tweens, experts say try to listen more than you talk these first few weeks. They may be feeling lots of new pressure academically as well as socially, and it's important to keep those lines of communication open right from the start. Um, Karen, I know that you got one. I was a wreck the other day. I know. You were you I was texting me. you, crying in the parking I, lot. I said, did you cry? And, but yeah. I didn't cry in front of her. <laughs> right, and she didn't cry. She was <laughs> no, fine. She did well. like, this mom. was a story <laughs> about students having a hard time going back to school. Not <laughs> but it's hard. No, no and then you're on the other half of the spectrum where you're waiting for yours to get yeah, out of yeah, college. Exactly and, right. Yeah, so. And that works. That's fine, too. <laughs> it's emotional. It, yeah, is. Yeah, it is. It is. Good it's advice, though. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, some big changes happening inside the Detroit Police Department. I like being a part of the, the movement that we have going on now. New here at 530, the key roles women are now in helping change the face of the department. And what this man right here did that left an entire police department without any way to patrol the streets. But first, a nurse charged with the murder of 84 people. A police say he did it without anyone noticing until now. Next. I teach people. New at 6. Imagine being here at work and your thoughts are at home in Houston where your family is. That's at least what some lines are going through right now. Also new at six, the search for a pair of thieves who made off with two very large and expensive items from a local Home Depot. All right, a real life horror story in Germany is becoming even more horrific. Niels Hogel was uh, allowed to cover his face at past court appearances. He is a, a nurse convicted of murdering two patients at a hospital with overdoses of a heart drug. Well, police suspected him in several more cases, and after exhuming other past patients, there is now evidence of at least 84 victims. 84. The toll may be even higher because other suspected victims were cremated. 
Over the years, the face of a police officer has changed as more women join the force. That's especially true for the Detroit Police Department, where women play an integral role. Our Coco McAvoy introduces us to a couple of female officers who are becoming the first women to join the special teams. Here, sit. Now, it's a good boy. Officer Shirlene Cherry trains her canine, Jimmy, every day. Every real life scenario, um, that I think that I'll ever have on the streets um, with Jimmy uh, is every scenario that we have actually trained for. She's the first female canine officer the department has had in decades, and it took her just three years to earn the title. I didn't think that I would be able to do it because the department, I mean, the canine unit was so small. And um, three years later, he called me and asked me, do you still want to do canine? I'm like, absolutely. Now she's one of only six on the team. I like being a part of the, the movement that we have going on now. The movement that's also made its way to the special response team. Aside from a different locker room, I, I don't feel any different from any of the other members. Officer Lauren Snyder is now a special response operator, joining a team with an elite reputation. They always went in the most high risk missions that just looked like something out of a movie. So who wouldn't want to be a part of that? One of the members asked her to try out. I thought, wow, if he would consider having me come down and try out, maybe I ought to. The training is rigorous. One of the things that we have to do that a lot of people have an issue with is repelling. A lot of people are scared of heights and don't want to lean over a five-story ledge and go down by a rope. They just don't trust it. But for the officers, it's well worth it. We have a department where they, they strive for diversity. They strive to have a police department that reflects the neighborhoods that we serve. And I'm really proud to be a part of that. To help prove women are more than capable by taking on positions many haven't had the chance to yet conquer. Because we have those desires too. We want to do it too. We have the ability to do it. Coco McAvoy, Local 4.